start of the First World War, the group had been in existence for only seven years. The war proved to be the multinational company's first real test. Holland remained neutral. Britain, meanwhile, joined France on the Western Front. The front line ran from Flanders and southwest Belgium all the way along to northeast France. Here at the Imperial War Museum in London, there's a permanent exhibition dedicated to this war. The British and the French refer to the First World War as the Great War, la Grande Guerre, because of the sacrifices their people had to make. Tens of thousands of soldiers had to be transported to the front using every possible means of transport, even double-decker buses and Parisian taxis. Germany started a massive advance of troops and equipment in order to achieve a rapid victory, but their attacks got stuck in the trenches. For four years, they fought each other along a front line of trenches that only moved a few kilometers, going backwards and forwards. It was an endless battle that resulted in millions of deaths. As in any other war, the desire for victory encouraged technical innovations. Tanks and planes were used for the first time. Also submarines, torpedoes, and deadly poisonous gases were developed. Lots of fuel was needed. The war interrupted about a third of the group's production, as oil from Russia and Romania could no longer be exported. But at the same time, the demand for oil increased tremendously, so the company had to work extremely hard in order to supply its markets. The war also caused a rift between various companies of Royal Dutch and Shell. In the Netherlands, Royal Dutch and Batafsa remained, like many Dutch companies, neutral. They continued to keep relations going with businesses in Germany, Austria and Romania. On the other hand, Shell Transport, Anglo-Saxon and Asiatic sided with the Allies, while Datading continued to lead the group from London. However, Batafsa wasn't completely neutral. It had a toluol plant in Rotterdam, which it sold to Anglo-Saxon. Under the supervision of Batafsa engineers, the plant was dismantled and rebuilt in the UK. The plant gave Anglo-Saxon a preeminent position in the production of high explosives and light gasoline. The activities of the group on either side of the front line caused distrust between all parties. The British suspected neutral Holland of supporting the Germans, and the Germans distrusted Royal Dutch because of their links with Britain through British Shell. So Royal Dutch found itself caught between two opposing camps. Dr. Jonker, could you explain what the main problems were that the group faced during the war? It is really the only internationally operating oil company. All the other ones are exporters from the United States. So its spread of operations around the globe is very difficult in times of war with the war at sea because all the logistic lines and communication line between the various operations are cut. And what about them having two bases, one in a neutral country and the other one in Britain, who of course is at war? Ah, that gives a problem immediately at the start of the war in August 1914, when Britain orders to cut four supplies to Germany. And when London instructs The Hague no longer to send oil to Germany, The Hague protests and say, we're neutral, we need to supply both sides in war, because otherwise one of these sides will accuse us of being partial. So they say, we need to ship to Germany. London solves that by Anglo-Saxon diverting supplies away from the continent, thereby effectively cutting supplies to Germany. Nonetheless, the Allies very clearly saw Shell as extremely helpful during the war. Why was this? Uh, first of all, Shell helps them in getting toluene. That's the high explosive ingredient that goes into TNT. And secondly, by being located in the United States, Shell could overcome its logistics and production problem, helping the Allies to fight a mechanised war against the far more static German armies. In November 1918, the war was over. The end of the war was greeted with jubilation. Tens of thousands of war veterans were honored with huge parades. 
The British government decided to honor Henry Dateding with a knighthood, and they promoted Sir Marcus to the peerage, the first Lord Bearstead. This was in recognition of Royal Dutch Shell's role during the war. Royal Dutch Shell recovered rapidly from their losses. One way they did this was by expanding production in Mexico, in Venezuela, and in America. And because of their profits that flowed from the Dutch East Indies, they became the largest producer of crude oil in the world. They also had the largest fleet of private tankers in the world. Meanwhile, new dangers loomed. As a consequence of war, many countries became aware of the strategic value of their oil resources. And governments of those oil producing countries started to ask for higher royalties. They were keen to control a sector that was so vital to the economy and so vital in any potential future conflict. Russia was experiencing rising nationalism. After the 1917 revolution, the government of Lenin nationalized the Russian oil industry, as with other industries. The main laboratory in Amsterdam is situated in the city's harbour on the northern shores of the Eye. It was actually built during the 20s at a time of many breakthroughs in chemical research and the style of the building reflects the self-confidence and the ambition of that period. From the beginning, systematic scientific research was very important for the development of the group. The Batafsa Petroleum Company used its laboratory in Amsterdam for all sorts of research. At that time, the work concentrated mainly on testing products and searching for possible improvements in the production processes. Gradually, research also started to focus on the structure and characteristics of the many different types of oil found in the world. The 20s saw a significant technical breakthrough in refining, known as cracking. Through a combination of pressure and heat, the heavy molecules of the oil were cracked into lighter ones. Not only did this process increase petrol production, it also made it possible to extract other products from crude oil. Royal Dutch Shell acquired the patents from the American inventor Jesse Dubbs and developed new processing plants on a large scale. On Curaçao in Indonesia, in Balikpapan, Mexico, and in Romania, the Dubs installations were built. With the arrival of cracking, the petrochemical era started. The installations produced hydrocarbon gases from which many chemical products could be made. And cracking increased yields of gasoline for cars, planes, and lorries. Shell expanded into the production of petrochemicals and developed important research facilities because the group wanted to be more than just a supplier of raw materials. Between 1925 and 1929, staff at the Amsterdam Laboratory expanded from 80 to 300 people. Amsterdam became the center of research within the group. Theoretical and process research were done side by side. Test factories were built on the site too. The research department in the Netherlands would grow to nearly 1,400 people. By 1938, Shell was spending $6 million per year on research. No other competitor was prepared to invest so much money. Gradually, Shell acquired new skills in making petrochemical products, such as solvents. The research team also made some important new insights into petrol itself. During the 30s, the group was the first to find a way of making iso-octane on a commercial scale. Iso-octane is a crucial component of high-grade fuel for aeroplane engines. <laughs> 